Hello, everyone. Uh, hope everything is fine, and uh, we will continue our discussion on the grab negative drawers uh, that are important in the respiratory tract. In the previous uh, lecture, we saw that uh, we have four clinically significant genera that causes respiratory tract infections in gram positive and gram negative organism. And that includes the hemophilus, the bordetella, the legionella, and acetobacterus. And the important species are the hemophilus influenzae, bordetella thiosis, legionella pneumophila, and uh, acetobacter bemini. Uh, we will uh, discuss today one of the very important organisms. Uh, the name of the organism that belongs to the genera Bordetella is the Bordetella tissus that causes uh, whooping cough. Uh, the other name for the disease is the tissus. Now, what we call it a whooping cough? But literally speaking, the whoop uh, is a loud cry or uh, enjoyment sound. Uh, this is this name is given to the disease because of the loud rasping, in dying breath. That really causes the voice in the in the patient. Now, if you look at the organism, and if you look at the at the diagram, uh, the organism, of course, is a gram-negative microorganism. The cell wall all have all have the characteristics uh, that are found in a gram-negative cell wall. It's a small cocobacillary organism. All of these four genera they are mostly the cocobacilli. A strict aerobic and it's a it's encapsulated microorganism. Now, if you look at the diagrammatic representation of the spike or gam, we will look into the few organisms. The organism does have the fimbri, uh, it does have the pili, it has the molecules for the tussis toxins, and it has the molecules for the what you call as the filamentous hemagglutinin, and it has the organism as the, uh, the tachyl cytotoxins, what you call as the TCT, some of the dermonectotic toxins. So the organism is full of toxins, juices toxins, hemoglobin toxins, uh, and it also has some of the uh, toxins that can control the, the cyclase toxins also. The vaccinated humans, they are the potential reservoir for the spike organism, and the transmission of the disease is through the respiratory airborne droplets. And these droplets, they are generated to coughing episodes of the visual who are already suffering from this disease or who have the have the uh, have taken the vaccines. The pathogen is only uh, to the humans and the animals, they are not prone to this infection. So strictly aerobic, encapsulated, fibrillated microorganism pathogen for the human has a number of toxins, and we're particularly concerned with the tachyl toxins and the filamentous immunization toxin along with that, the two toxin. These are the three most important component of the tussis organism that contributes towards the virulence of the spike organism. We have seen that uh, many stains that lack these component of the bacterial cell, they do not cause the disease. So the mutant stains of body tussis that do not have the genes for the synthesis of the tussis toxins or for the other toxins, they do not cause a disease. Now, let me take one moment in the very beginning to just realize that oh, what is the real significance in the clinical science of whooping cough? It is deadly for the babies. Deadly for the babies. The whooping cough is respiratory infection that causes severe infection, severe coughing, and it causes trouble in breathing. Now, half of the infants who have this disease, they have to go to the hospitalized. So we have to be very, very careful, very, very careful. And the remedies lie with the prevention of this disease, as we see nowadays in the case of coronaviruses. All those diseases caused by viruses, bacteria, which are aerosol and transmissions, they mostly have to, we have to depend on most of them for the prevention of those diseases. So this disease is very common in infants and children. And the only remedy for this is to have the vaccination for that. We will discuss at the end of the lecture. Now, if I could look at the, the, the epidemiology of the microorganism and you look at the 
this organism is exclusively a mucosal surface pathogen. It loves to live in the mucosal surfaces. It attaches itself to the nasal fringes, ciliated epithelial cells, and it does not invade the underlying tissue. It's not an MSM organism. It adheres, it attaches, it secretes and liberates its toxins, but it does not penetrate into the lying tissue. So if the toxins, they damage, they destroy, and then they, they decrease the ciliary activities of, the, of the cilia. This leads to subsequent death and the dysfunction of the ciliated epithelial cells, and this is what they call as the ciliar stasis. The functions of the cilia, they, they stop. And this organism and the disease itself is highly contagious, highly contagious in infants and young children. Now, the incidence of this disease, they have been decreased because of the widespread use of vaccines that were used previously. And these vaccines provide protection for two to three years of time. And when an individual reaches at the age of eight to 10, it stays it again getting this, start getting this problem. This is because of the diminishing or waning of the immunity. And we have observed the outbreaks of the disease back in 2005, 10, and 12. This, you see, necessitated, uh, it really emphasized the use of booster that is needed to overcome this disease process. In order to provide long-term immunity, we will have to give the booster doses. Now, if you look at the diagram, the transmission of the pathogens is very simple. Uh, very simple. Uh, the organism enters into the body through aerosol. Excuse me. And then the after enters the body, the body reduces it, uh, uh, attaches with the ciliated epithelial cells with the help of hemoglobin uh, receptors. And that it multiplies and it increases in numbers. And this increases the number also because it's the secretions of mucus over there. Then it causes the paralysis and destruction of the cilia. And of course, the secretion of the layers that remains over there because of the action of the various toxins. And there is inflammatory reactions and hyperlipotosis, which is characteristic in that. We'll discuss all these things, but just realize at this time, the organism present in the environment, respiratory droplets gets in, it sticks to the cilia, it sticks over there, it attaches over there, does not penetrate deeper, and it's starting releasing toxins. And these toxins, they contribute towards the virulence and the appearance of whooping cup in the patient. Now, uh, there are several factors that contribute towards the pathogenicity of this organism. Uh, as I told you that the organism, it attaches to the cilia, and this attachment of the organism to the cilia is mediated by a protein which is present on the pili, and this protein is known as the filamentous hemoglobin, FH protein, FAP. Uh, the antibodies against these filamentous hemoglobin proteins, they inhibit the attachment. So in other words, we can say that once the organism it attaches itself with the help of the filamentous glutinins, to the pili, uh, the, to, the, to these receptors on the ciliated epithelia, uh, it, if the body responds fully, and the individual's functions are fully, you see the immunity is fully functional, it will produce antibodies, and these antibodies will provide protection of the disease. But look at, look at the, the fate of the disease. In infants and in children, the immune system is not fully developed. The, in, the patient, I mean the individual, the infants and children, they are still dependent on the maternal immunity. So that's why they don't have full immunity and the organism gets its full chances to adhere and attach to the cell and causing a disease. Now the Tussis toxin, uh, it stimulates the adenylate cyclase and it catalyzes the addition of the erosine diphosphate ribose, what we call the ADP ribosylation. Now, this ADP ribosylation it results in prolonged stimulation and export of adenylate cyclase, and this increases consequently it increases the cyclic MPs, and uh, it also increases some of the proteins which are dependent on the cyclic MPs and all that. Now, because of this, there is impaired leukocytosis, uh, leukocyte chemotaxis. This inhibits the phagocytosis, that means decrease the uh, to the organism 
and this led into the local edema. So there is ADP lipoxylation that enhances the adenine cyclase and common leading to the what you call as the leukocyte chemotaxis. Uh, there is a uh, antiphagocytic activation, a local ability uh, edema develop, and that contributes towards the toxicity. Because when you see the fluid accumulate over there, the intaking of environment of the oxygen is really difficult. And when it goes in, because of the inflammation of the glottis, it really penetrates to the skin. There is forceful penetration of the air in the, in, uh, in the lungs. And that really creates a source. That will be called, probably called as the, the tussis uh, woo. Now, the tussis toxins, it is uh, what you call as quasi lymphocytosis. And uh, the lymphocytosis is in the blood patient. The toxin, it inhibits uh, some of the signals and resulting into the failure of lymphocytes to enter into the lymphatic tissues, uh, particularly into the spleen and the lymph nodes. Now, because the lymphocytes, they cannot go into the lymphatic tissues, so they increase in their numbers in the blood vessels, and uh, this is what we call as the, the leukocytosis. leukocytosis. It also activates the other cells that leads to hypoglycemia, and it also increases some integrity. But most you will find the lymphocytosis, if an organism having a cough, uh, which gives zoops, and you will find the, the high number of lymphocytes uh, in the blood, particularly the neutrophils, and you will see that uh, this is uh, most probably the, the infection with the body reductuses. Now, the tracheal cytotoxin, uh, the fragments of the bacterial peptidoglycan damage, chelated cells. So the tracheal toxin is the fragment of the peptidoglycan layer. It appears that mostly of the endotoxin induces nitric acids, nitric oxides, and this nitric oxide, it interferes with the ciliary functions, it damages the cilia, dysfunction of the cilia, and leads to the ciliostasis. Now the clinical findings, uh, uh, most you will see that there is involvement of the upper respiratory tract, and uh, in associated with that of the acute tracheal bronchitis, the, the followed by the severe proxismal cough that lasts one to four weeks. This is very, very, you see the, the characteristic of this whooping cough. Because it goes for a long time, one to four to five weeks time, and there are proxismal stages, you see the severe, severe cough uh, because of the accumulation of mucus in the, in the trachea. The series of hacking coughs, copious amount of mucus deposits over there, it ends with the inspiratory wolves that is characteristic, and air rushes past to the narrow glottis. So the glottis, because of the inflammation, becomes narrow. The air passes in, rushes in, and that rushing of air creates wolves. That's what we call as the whooping cup. The organism is restricted to the respiratory tract. So the, you will not find an organism in the blood because it is not that much invasive. That's why that if you attempt to isolate this spike organism from the blood culture, you will not get any kind of problems over there. Because of, the disease is because of the toxins liberated, not because mostly of the septicemia and all that. The organism is not in the blood. So we will not isolate the microorganism in the laboratory from the blood, but we will adopt other procedures for the diagnosis of the disease. The organism remains restricted with respiratory tract pronounced leukocytosis with 70% of lymphocytes, as we have shown that because of the lymphocytosis, there is the percentage of lymphocytes goes up to 70%, and this increases the leukocytosis code cone. There is central nervous system oxia, exhaustion due to severe coughing, and that may occur individuals if uh, uh, untreated or unnoticed due to the severe pneumonia. Uh, the classic group in young children, uh, and it is proxismal in, in, in appearance, and same we can have the manifestations like this in case of uh, adults also. So adults more than age of uh, 60, 60, 55, they are involved, and infants in the age of uh, two to three years, and even in earlier can be involved. So the laboratory diagnosis, as I just said, that because the organism is not present in the blood stream, so we hardly go for the isolation. 
if we have to go for, we will have to go for the nasopharyngeal swabs, and uh, this swab has to be collected during the proxismal stage. And a specialized medium is used for the growth of microorganism. And uh, we try to isolate the microorganism not from the blood, but from the nasopharyngeal swab. No, but the bordered gangu medium. This medium is highly enriched medium. It contains high percentage of blood, 20% to 30% of the blood, compared to that of the normal blood agar that contains 5 to 7% of the total blood. And this, I mean, the component to the inactivate the inhibitors of this gene. Now we can also identify the microorganism based on the glutination with specific anti-sera. Uh, this or the growth of this microorganism on the bordered kangaroo medium is very very slow. So we can also go for the direct fluorescent antibody staining of the nasopharyngeal you know, specimen. You make a specimen, you stain it with the fluorescent antibody stains, and you can see it on the microscope. Some of the serological tests to identify the prevalence of uh, antibodies in the serum can be used, but PCR is highly specific and highly recommended because of its sensitivity and its specificity. It really targets on to the body tail acuses and it gives you high, the low number of organisms can be detected with a high specificity. So PCR is the, is the method of choice for the lab diagnosis. A treatment is, uh, you see, it has to be it's very questionable. Azithromycin drug, it is the drug of choice. Uh, the drug, because it's an antimicrobial drug, it does not, you see, neutralize the toxins that are really cause of damage to the cilia, but it can reduce the number of microorganisms and can also reduce the scanty complications of scanty infections. But it has nothing to do with the existing pertussis stage of the, the patient. Uh, it has a little effect on the disease, as it said. Uh, but to supportive cases, we have to keep in mind the oxygen therapy, the suction of the excessive mucosol so that it can facilitate uh, the eliminator spaces during the proximal stage and important, uh, especially in, in infants. So as we have seen that we don't have much treatment options because the organism does, is not invasive. It is not present in the blood. It's very difficult to isolate. And the pathogenicity is mostly based on the different toxins liberated by this microorganism. So the only way left is the prevention of the microorganism. Now how we can prevent it? We can prevent by the help of two types of toxins which are available. Sorry, the vaccines. The vaccine of child which is being used today or nowadays is a cellular vaccine. Means it does not have the complete cell. It does not have all the components of the cell. It contains the purified proteins that are really highly immunogenic. Now, previously we used to have a killed vaccine and that just contained the inactivated attenuated whole produces microorganism. And the problem of this vaccine was that it was not that much long uh, immunity provider. Moreover, there were chances that it, it can reactivate because there is whole cell over there. And if the pathogenicity of the whole cell that has been used for the manufacturing of the killed vaccine. It has not been decreased to the full extent and its virulence still persists to some extent, it can cause a disease. So in order to overcome these uh, rep, uh, recurrence of the infections are because of the low immunogenic potential of the killed vaccines, the acellular vaccine has been produced, which is a genetically engineered vaccine and it contains five purified antigens. Uh, which inactivated produces toxins, the genetically engineered toxides, uh, which are immunogens also. The other two antigens that includes in this toxin, what we call an acellular toxin, the filamentous hemagglutination, then protectin is another protein which is present, then fimbri, particularly type 2 and type 3, which are, uh, which are immunogenic, they have been included. So we are not using the whole cell. We have, you see, the clone, the gene of uh, various four or five proteins and we have made a genetically engineered toxin which is very much safe and effective. Uh, there are very few side effects and uh, but it has also you see this short immunity we will have to go for the booster doses. Uh, this toxin, the open toxin, it is given in combination with diphtheria toxins and tetanus toxin. What we call as the DTAPs, diphtheria toxin, acellular filters. 
in three doses at the months of two months of age, then booster at months of for 12 and 15, and then another booster uh, at the age of school is recommended. So we have uh, one basic dose in the early months, then another after one year, and then another one. And this is in a combination with the diphtheria, tetanus, toxin, along with that of the ACLA to the DTAP. Now, uh, if you're working in a pediatric clinic and you have a critical role to play over there, being a clinician, the prevention of intense tuses is your primary job. Now, how we can go for that? We have to encourage the use of the toxins particularly for the pregnant women uh, you encountered in your practice. Always widen to go for these toxins because the idea molecules, they can pass through the placenta and can provide protection to the babies. Or you will have to administer these toxins, the toxin, the DTAP toxin, to all your patients on schedules for going to school. Now, people of all ages, they need to access, starting from, you see, from two to four months of age, at 11 years of age, at 12 years of age, at eight years of age, the pregnant woman, they are most particularly in need of this false toxin. So please keep in mind, for the rest of your life, that if you are working in a pediatric clinic, or a gynecological clinic, and you come across your patient of infants and pregnant women, do advise them the whooping cup uh, vaccination uh, schedule. Uh, we have commercially available two types of whooping cup uh, vaccines available. One is with the name of uh, Boostrix, other one is Adacil. Both have all these combinations of producing tetanus and uh, bacteria. Uh, the pregnant women, as I said, uh, their CD2 C toxins uh, to protect the newborn babies. Uh, the IgG, they can pass the placenta and protect the newborns. A uh, killed vaccine is no longer used because uh, it can cause to encephalopathy, so we have uh, uh, we have to avoid this. Uh, more of it's not nowadays available in the market. Azithromycin is useful in prevention, particularly in unimmunized individuals, but it, is, it cannot be used as a treatment. Uh, be given to exposed individuals, particularly the children younger than four years of age, uh, because the vaccine-induced immunity does not provide complete protection. So we'll have to go for the antimicrobial sportive therapy, along with that of the uh, toxides. Now please remember once again, that don't forget to immunize the newly born babies. Give the immunization to the pregnant woman and don't forget to follow the immunization regime for the newly born babies. Uh, that was about the modular tussis. We have another organism, uh, and we'll finish it in, uh, in, the, in the time. Uh, that is again a cocoa based in shape. It's a gram negative microorganism. It has a single flagellum, what we call as the monotype of flagella. It has fibri and all that. And this organism, it is faintly stained. We cannot stain, we can stain with the head of Gramsci procedure, but it is not stained fully. We cannot see it under the microscope by the gram stain staining. If we have to see it, I have told you, and you still remember, that we have to use the time of the counter stain. The saffronin time has to be increased in order to facilitate the utilization of this microorganism under the microscope. Now, the microorganism is what we call as the genus Legionella. The name of the microorganism is the Legionella nemophila. Now, this organism, uh, it causes pneumonia, uh, both in the hospitalized individual, hospitalized compromised individuals, and in the community. And the genus has got its name because of its first appearance in people uh, uh, who were participating in the American Legion Convention in Philadelphia. Uh, so what is not called as the degenerate disease, another name for this microorganism that it causes. Uh, the gram organic negative microorganism, cocoa based in shape, stain poorly with the gram stains. Uh, the tissue biopsy that is mainly stained with the hematoxin and urine stain, uh, we do not use that. We have to use another staining procedure, what we call it, this silver staining card. So both the gram negative gives faint staining, the hematoxin, urine stain, it 
does not stain fully. So we'll have to enhance the counter stain staining saffronin in order to see this microorganism under the microscope or to see tissues under the microscope. We have to use this silver staining procedure instead of H and E staining procedures. The organism is transmitted again with the inhalation of the aerosol water. Please remember, not aerosol droplets, which is present in the environment, but aerosol water droplets. It's less commonly transmitted by the uh, aspiration of the drinking water. Uh, person to person transmission is uh, not that common. You know, the name, as I said, is the Legionnaires disease, and we also call it a contact fever. Uh, this is the collective name referred to the legionellosis. So, legionellosis, it causes legionellosis, or what you can call as the contact fever or legionary disease. This organism has almost 60 different species of legionella. This genus has 60 species. And the most considered pathogen is the legionella nemophila. The disease is mainly caused by minophila, zero groups one. And this organism cannot be normally grown into the normal body medium, even on the blood agar, but we need a highly enriched medium for this growth. And it needs to be concentrated with iron, and cysteine in order to get more results with this microorganism. Now, some people, they are at risk with these infections, uh, particularly the individuals who are uh, equal to or more than the age of 60 years, and they're smokers, and they are either the current or the historical smokers, and they are having the habits of intoxication with them with uh, uh, with wines and all that. The chronic lung diseases, uh, such as such as the, the emphysema and other diseases, they are uh, more prone to these infections. The immune system disorders uh, that due to the diseases are drugs also predisposes these individuals toward these infections. Systemic malignancies and other underlying illnesses such as diabetes, the renal failure, hepatic failure, or corticosteroid therapies, or individuals on uh, immunocompromisation therapies, they are all on risk. The recent travel history, uh, and particularly staying in cruises, in hotels, in, in, in combined areas, and in the other healthcare facilities, they are risk factor for the individual. I spoke it to the heart cups because it has been observed that the organisms survive well in the hot water. Now, what are the sources? That was the risk factors, the individuals who are really prone to this kind of infection. Now, the various sources that cause the spread of this infection in these individuals, it was natural fresh water environment. It is important. This song is not found in, in stagnant waters, it's in fresh waters. Fresh water environment, not in sufficient numbers. It's not found in sufficient numbers in the freshwater environment. Transmittable to the susceptible host by aerolization of the man-made water systems of large buildings. The large building, the water heaters, the storage tanks, the pipes, the cooling towers, the decorative the fountains, all those things which are used as the requirement and the decorative uh, uh, need for the big buildings like hospitals, the hostels, the hotels, uh, they are really a source of this aerosol infection. Now, if you have a patient has a history of traveling and stay in hotels, resorts, and cruise ships, and because these, these, these they use normally the complex water system, and they generate aerosols. These devices they generate aerosols. So if the organism is present in the aerosol, you will have the infection. Hospitals and long-term care facilities hosting susceptible individuals are more common. Now, particularly in the old houses, in the daycare centers uh, for the newly it's, 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 it's a source for that. Now, uh, how the Legionella, they affect to the building water system. If you look at this, uh, there is internal and external factors that can lead to legionosis. 
such as the construction and the other of the biofilms there is water uh, temperature fluctuations that facilitates its, uh, its survival the lizard also grows best in large complex water systems as we have in large buildings and cool these hospitals and then of course the water cooling lizard is aerosolized through the various as like the cooling towers showers hot tubs fountains they generate the aerosols and of course then when they are inhaled you get the infection the pathogen you see the organism enters it grows and multiplies within the small one celled organism like amoeba and ciliated protozoans so ciliated protozoan and amoeba this organism grow within them because these single celled organism they provide nutrition for the replication and the growth of this microorganism and these organism they also protect the legionella from the adverse environmental conditions like temperature and chlorine which is used to get a uh, uh, disinfect this, uh, this, uh, this water so the legionella microorganism has adopted its strategies to for its survival and replication growing to be hide in self into ciliated protozoan and these proto proto protozoan they protect them from the environmental condition now uh, the human immune cell particularly the algal macrophages they look very similar to the protozoan so once they enter into the body they protect themselves in the macrophages so in wait them they grow within the algal macrophages and they mistake a natural host and cause a disease over there so this is the only organism that i have seen so far that is really can uh, be defeated that it is defeating him itself right instead of you see it can see that as the algal macrophages are their protectors but they can cause disease to them the lipoporous kind Uh, which is the real virulent factors, and it does not have any endotoxin because organism is, I don't know, the gram negative. It has the lipoprotein level that acts as an endotoxin. It does not have any endotoxin. So this is again all this is what we see. We have the lizard of free that goes into the environment, and then it is uh, raised by these factors, go into the lungs, and these areas like you see the AC cooling holding system. It, it, this is a diagrammatic presentation of. Uh, what i have already said now the clinical finding is the very mild influenza like symptoms uh, but the severe pneumonia which is accompanied by the maternal perfusion ventral perfusion normal diarrhea protein urea and hematuria these are the classic signs uh, scanty non prolonged sputum uh, we have a high amount of uh, natrium in, in the blood uh, the incubation period is 5 to 10 days and uh, in immune compromised individuals particularly you see the target uh, population is more than 60 years old so they are or one another they have the immune compromisation so the organism is very fat in that it may cause the atypical pneumonia and atypical pneumonia caused uh, all pneumonia caused by other organism uh, rest of the rest of the pneumonia is the atypical we have to differentiate them from the mycoplasma viral and streptococcus due fevers A lab diagnosis is simple as gram stains. You will see no bacteria, but the neutrophils. The organism cannot be grown with the ordinary media. Uh, we need a rich charcoal yeast extractor. Antibody titer can be detected, and uh, we can have the infected tissues see by the fluorescent antibody staining procedures. We can go for the colagglutinin. So normally, you see the diagnosis is based on to the uh, demonstration of the antigen in the tissue with the fluorescent antibody stain and having the uh, what you called as the golden routine test uh azithromycin or erythromycin with or without campesin is can be used thoracolin or can also be used uh, there are also factors like uh, legionella hemophilia mycoplasma pneumonia streptococcus pneumonia uh, uh, that's what it is now this is one slide and we are almost done and uh, this is uh, another organism a cytobacter laminae the skin is having the all the same characteristics uh, cocobacteria gram negative pond in soil and water it does have a colonized in the skin and respiratory tract this is an opportunistic pathogen and it can easily recognize the patient with compromised host defenses uh it invades the individuals in the human factors see in the hospitalized setting uh particularly those associated with respiratory therapy equipment ventilators pneumonia is one of the common 
the one of the common ventilator associated pneumonia in hospitalized individual or an indoubling catheter is caused by the acetobacterial pneumonia. This is the real significance of clinical tests because of my cognition. It can also cause the the UTI infections, uh, most frequent manifestations. Uh, this organism is marked, remarkably antibiotic resistant. Some of the organisms do not respond to any of the microorganisms. So organism is very much resistant, do not respond, and sometimes none of the micro, none of the antibacterial drug. One of the leading cause of hospital associated pneumonia, particularly ventral associated pneumonia. So we have to be very very careful. Meparin, uh, uh, manipanum. If the organism is really sensitive, we can use the drug of choice. Uh, cholesterol may also be used, and there is no vaccine. So keep in mind, acetobacter ventilator associated pneumonia is very common. Acetobacter in deviling catheter associated sepsis is very common. There is no vaccine. We are having shortage of antimicrobial chemotherapy because of high resistance of this microorganism. So be careful. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your time and uh, thank you very much for your time and everything. Bye.